Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. For 28 years, this TV series has explored a wide variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. We especially provide opportunities for the public to hear voices and viewpoints that are rarely heard in mainstream media. This month, we'll explore an issue that most of us just do not see. The problem is largely hidden for most of us, but it is very real. And this is the problem of human trafficking. <clears throat> some people are trafficked as workers to be abused, and some people are trafficked to be exploited for sex. We'll look at problems, and we will look at solutions. We'll lift up the work of several nonprofit organizations, especially Washington Engage, that has a great website at www.wangage.com. And they have local affiliates in a number of communities around the Puget Sound area, including Thurston County. We have three very knowledgeable guests who will help us explore the topic. We have Rose Gunderson, who is the co-founder and executive director of Washington Engage. And this is a nonprofit organization that works on the issue. We will discuss Washington Engage's work throughout this hour. Rose Gunderson has a law degree and much experience researching and working on human trafficking. Dr. Carolyn West has a master's degree and a PhD in clinical psychology. She has done extensive professional and academic work on domestic violence and sexual violence and other forms of oppression. She teaches about these at the University of Washington campus in Tacoma. Linda Malinchuk Finnan is the local leader of the Thurston County Coalition Against Trafficking. She also has long experience working with the National Organization for Women and other progressive activities for peace and human rights. So welcome to all of you. Glad you're here. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. We should start by helping the viewers understand what the term human traffic means. Lindy, can you tell us something about this? Yes. Um, I wanted to start with the idea that we are all, we are all human because mm -hmm. trafficking denies the humanity of people. And the human rights uh, declaration by the United Nations is a good place to start. Uh, so a few of the articles that pertain to their declaration that particularly fit trafficking is where they start with all humans are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That's their very first article. Then that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of persons. And that no one shall be held in slavery, servitude, or slave trade shall be prohibited in all forms. And that's because trafficking is really modern day slavery. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Rose, when we were preparing for the TV program, you told me that human trafficking is actually increasing worldwide. Tell us about this. Yeah, according to the UN and other sources of authority, it's the fastest growing crime in the world. Um, and it's the second largest, um, it's second only to drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. And that's the um, enormity of the problem. Uh -huh. It's, um, we'll be talking mostly in this program about people who are trafficked, sent around, bought and sold, rented out, whatever, for, uh, for sexual purposes, exploitation. But there's also this, the, the trafficking of people for uh, workers, for their labor, uh, to be mm -hmm. exploited in that way. Linda, can you tell us something about that angle, that part of it? Yes, it, it's... Um if, if anything, even more hidden in plain sight than, than sex trafficking, because it is individuals who may be working in fields, if you're in an agricultural area, it may be working in restaurants, it may be in as nannies. It, it's in areas that, um, if we see them at all, they are, seem to be and appear to be working in a perfectly normal circumstance, but they may have uh, no recourse to um, uh, powers of their own, uh, mm -hmm. ability to leave there wherever they are. Um, they may have no um, uh, cell phones or mm -hmm. 
um, charge cards or uh, yeah, ability to um, find themselves uh, help in mm -hmm. any way, and yet they need they need help because it may not have been what they originally bargained for. They may have been lied to about what they were getting into as a job. Yeah, I've, I've read articles about people in some other country. They'll respond to an ad, you know, good jobs mm -hmm. in the United States, mm -hmm. and they'll go show up and apply. And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get you a good job in the United States, mm -hmm. and it'll cost you whatever amount of money for our fee and for the airfare, and, and you can work it off when you get there. And you work, you know, you get to the U.S., and they put you in somebody's home as their housekeeper, maid, cook, whatever. You work, you know, twenty-four seven. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're there, and you can't get out. Mm -hmm. And they and they've taken your Documents. your documentation, mm -hmm. and so you have no identity in this yeah. country, no <laughs> legal standing, no recourse, and you're trapped. You're not allowed to leave. Right. And and you've become a slave in somebody's house. And and it's also very typical for these traffickers to know where their country of origin is know their family and say, if you do anything, if you don't do what I say, your yeah. parents will be killed, you, your, your family is yeah. threatened, and that is very real and that happens often. Right, because the, the source point is some exploiter from their home yeah. country who recruits yeah, people from that country. Yeah, I mean, it could be the people from their own village, sad, yeah. sadly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so it, it's, it, it's, it's a low, it's a no status thing where you, you end up being yeah. very much like, like, like a slave. Um, was there something else you were going to add nope. on that? Is that was that was it? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Um, uh, is there anything else we need to say about the labor? The when we talk about the sex trafficking, a lot of that is labor because it's exploiting people for sexual work. Mm -hmm. uh, both both of them uh, are defined in a similar way when it comes to the the federal uh, definition of. Uh, human trafficking mm -hmm. and uh, prosecuted um, that the factors that each of the situations have in common mm -hmm. are force fraud or coercion uh, in or are used to control the people in mm -hmm. that circumstance whether it's for sexual exploitation mm -hmm. or whether it's for labor exploitation other than if you're a minor under 18 you don't have to prove um, uh, Coercion in order to mm. you know s s claim or you know yeah. show that you were trafficked, yeah. but uh, force, fraud, and coercion are the defining elements of human trafficking. Yeah, and we'll see that show up as we get into the sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rose, you're, you've become an expert on this over the, over the years, and I wonder if you could just provide some basic information about trafficking persons to abuse them for sexual purposes. Just a, and we'll get into more detail as we go through the interview. What, what, what's the starting point for, uh, for the viewers to understand? Um, typical stories are maybe a runaway, a t young runaway, or women who are in desperate situations who are in need of economic support, and then they get recruited by, say, a runaway who's hungry and cold in the street, and someone comes along, really they, they are traffickers, professional mm -hmm. criminals, mm -hmm who can see that this child is in need, recruit wine and dine and, and give them clothing and, and, um, and say you, you're, you know, become their boyfriend. Uh -huh. um, then after, it, it wouldn't take long. Uh -huh. A week to a month, two mm -hmm. months, then they turn them into mm -hmm. um, prostitution. So it, it seems like it's, it's like a lot of other um like domestic violence or a lot of other kinds of crimes where there's a, a huge power imbalance. Mm -hmm. Somebody is extremely vulnerable. Exactly. They're poor, you got no place really to live, mm -hmm. you're, uh, you have very low self-esteem, whatever, 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 yeah. and somebody comes along to kind of rescue you. Oh, you're so beautiful, oh, mm -hmm. I, wanna, I wanna really uh, be your friend, or yeah. help you out, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And like I say, it could be some little period of time and all of a sudden, that, yeah. that power imbalance persists mm -hmm. and, the, and the person becomes property. Yeah, and the power comes from control, emotional control, yeah. um, controlling everything, including the cell phone. And um, also, similar to labor trafficking, many of the victims I know that they told their story say, he knows that I have a little sister at home. If I don't mm -hmm. do what he yeah. says, he's going to kill her. Yeah. He's going to harm her. Mm -hmm. And that is another form, yeah, common. That, yeah, mm -hmm. Dr. West, you have a lot of expertise in, in domestic violence, and you see probably some common 
patterns here? Absolutely. I mean, trafficking really could happen to anybody. We, certainly if you're more vulnerable and they recruit outside schools. I worked in a low income neighborhood in St. Louis uh, before I moved here and the pimps would be outside near the school bus stops. They could mm -hmm. be anywhere mm -hmm. at the mall, uh, foster care situation. Mm -hmm. So they could be anywhere. So you, you have expertise in uh, domestic violence, uh, sexual violence, and, and the trafficking and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 it's kind of a common pattern then throughout these kinds of things that we're talking about. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Uh, children who are exposed to domestic violence in their home are just so vulnerable uh -huh. uh, to being trafficked as yeah. well as other problems. So. Yeah. And see, Linda, I think you had told me on the phone that when we were preparing for the program that sometimes a, like a, a boyfriend will, will e even pimp his actual girlfriend, not just somebody with like the illusion of, oh, will you be my girlfriend? And then you, you hook the person in. But, and I've read about this too in the background. All of you provided good background material, so I studied up on this. Thanks for studying. Yes, and, and unfortunately that's true. And um, I think there's an effect that we'll be, you know, maybe we'll get to when we talk about what role our culture has played mm -hmm. in um, making it easier for boys and girls to believe they have either the right to do this or to fall into it. Uh, and so I, I know situations in some of the high schools where somebody who professes to be a boyfriend will say, well, we need this amount of money maybe to go away for a weekend. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we'll be able to do it if you take care mm -hmm. of my friend. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then if the girl, for whatever reason, I mean, if she feels like she loves the fellow mm -hmm. and she wants to go away with him, then she'll do mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and that, that reduces the uh, threshold so it makes it easier the next time, the next time, the next time. Yeah. Dr. Wist, do you, you know about some of the variations, varieties of ways in which people are exploited in these things. Can you tell us some more things that, we, that might help us understand? I think, again, it's <coughs> typically people who are really vulnerable, young people who are very vulnerable. And so not only economically disadvantaged, but oftentimes I'm seeing young women who are emotionally neglected as well. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be a, a way that traffickers can get access to them. A, a bit later in the program, we'll talk about some of these illicit massage parlors, yes. and uh, maybe now we could talk about the, the some of the internet advertising. That's my understanding is that the, there, it's instead of hanging out on the street corners, it's mm -hmm. now more through internet yeah. or even in private homes that advertise. You know, call me at this number or whatever. Yeah, much of it mm -hmm. has moved off the street. And much of it is happening online now. Uh -huh. There are websites such as Backpage, and there's an erotic service section okay. where that can take place. And I understand that Craigslist, under pressure, removed their section. Is that I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I've written. Supposedly, supposedly, yes. Oh, okay, um, yeah. But the most outrageous one is Backpage, and they mm -hmm. make about, according to some statistics. 30, 40 billion dollars a, a million a, a year from the erotic mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. ad, um, and they refuse to to do anything to minimize the risk to, to, to the posting of especially minors. They actually have sued our state, mm -hmm. and our state had lost in the lawsuit for infringing on their First Amendment rights. Uh -huh. there, there's, there's a concept, uh, a term, commercial sexual exploitation uh, could I mean and that that name has popped up that term commercial sexual exploitation could somebody tell us what that means yeah so it's much more than forced prostitution it's also pornography it's strip clubs so it's the exchange of sex for money essentially uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. and and that becomes exploitative because of the, the power imbalance especially or, or or the potential for violence what mm -hmm. what else is going on well, it's when I, the power imbalance has to do with money that these businesses mm -hmm. owners expect from the workers, you, mostly women or uh -huh. even young girls. Uh -huh. they, um, the exploitation comes because 
these girls and you know the dancers in strip clubs or in massage parlors, mm -hmm. they don't get paid unless they do all kinds of coercive, endure sexual assault, mm -hmm. do exactly what the owners say. It's not, uh, they're not free agents. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, they have to pay rent up front mm -hmm. to the owner every night, 150 to $200 a night, plus having to tip all the DJs and managers, whatever is left, they get to take home. Just think, how could you be called a worker when you have to pay everybody and then take whatever is left? Yeah. Um, so that's labor exploitation at minimum. Yeah. And of course, um, they are being forced and expected to endure sexual assault and do more than what's le legal in order to make enough money uh, for themselves. So they, um, they are being coerced into prostitution or other forms of sex mm -hmm. act. Um, and that's, that's why the whole scene is uh, an exploitation mm -hmm. um, business. Yeah. That's why we call it commercial mm -hmm. sexual exploitation. Okay. Now, people should not assume that this is just a big city problem. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the, uh, at the introduction, at the beginning of, the, of this program, I said this is largely hidden for most of us. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to assume that some of the stuff happens only in other countries or only in big cities, but it happens here. and, and uh, even in, here in Thurston County, and, and uh, some of you folks know, you folks all probably know about the, the case where a, a woman from another country uh, is now lives in, in uh, Thurston County, and um, she's actually spoken out about mm -hmm. what her experience was. Uh, and I, I don't know the story. I, I haven't uh, spent time at the website. I haven't researched that, and I don't know what we what can be said without. Can you summarize what the, um, her situation was? I guess I'd, I'd like to say that the role that, that some survivors have been able to uh, fulfill in terms of educating the rest of us and making everybody more aware of what happened to them and the, the, the situation, the process that they had to go through mm -hmm. has been absolutely invaluable and they have been tremendously courageous mm -hmm. in coming forward with that. Um, and um, it's not my story to tell, but I wanted to thank them very much yeah. for their, their ability and their courage in doing so, yeah. and that they um, do presentations in the schools, they are able to help uh, and, and provide training for a variety of, of um, uh, city employees and police and yeah. Or you know, just community people, and I've I've certainly benefited from listening to their to their stories and putting it and hearing them put it in the context of um, various parts of our um, social system, mm -hmm. uh, so that yes, it happens even here locally, and the fact that some of these uh, survivors have been able to turn their own lives around and work to help the rest of us move forward mm -hmm. on ending it is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And I, I really, they're, they're without peer. Yeah, I'm hoping that helps with the healing process. It probably does. Mm -hmm. I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I'm looking at one, so <laughs> I'm guessing maybe it helps. Does, it, does that I help? I think it does help. I think talking about this and giving, uh, having a language for it, because sometimes people who are victimized don't even have a language to talk about it and may not identify themselves as victims until yeah. they hear someone else's oh, story. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, uh, and I, we can give the, the website, and we actually have lettering that can appear on the screen as if by, by magic. It's www.ashho.net. And uh, the, uh, that A-S-H-H-O is, is uh, it's inspired by a word from this person's language from her home country, uh, and it, it translated roughly as to, to beckon or instruct another or to, to come forward. So it's like, so she's putting it out there yeah. to say, um, you know, we're. She's raising awareness. She's yeah. sharing her story yeah, and this she's is educating others. Yeah. 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 Um, 
I watched a video on a website of truckers against trafficking. I never would have guessed there was such a thing, but I found it through, I think through your Washington Engage website or someplace I was researching and I found this thing, truckers against trafficking. These guys that drive these big trucks, mm -hmm. uh, they not only hear a lot of stuff and sometimes they end up kind of transporting people in the passenger seat across state lines and whatnot, but at the truck stops, carloads of girls and women come out and service the drivers that go from truck to truck to truck and pimps drive them out and do this. And my understanding of this is, and correct me if I misunderstood, is that, that some truckers who recognize the problem mm -hmm. um, created this nonprofit group and they're urging other truckers to, when you see something at a truck stop, like that going on, uh, call law enforcement. So they're using the the toll free line for the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, yeah, one eight 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 thirty seven thirty seven eight eight eight, and they have this website truckersagainsttrafficking.org. dot org. And this is interesting. And I think that's a great example of how everybody can do something to combat this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and good for them because they know they're probably at the front line of places where it happens often and they're willing to stand up even among their peers they're yeah. trying to stand up for it and, yeah. and I really and appreciate their and, and they're mostly men who say yeah. we're not going to stand for yeah. this. And that's when we get a little bit more into the second half of the program and talk about solutions one of them is no matter where you're at find some way that you can be a leverage point to help. Yeah. And here are these guys that you would assume are in the culture of the guys who are victimizing these yeah. women. And these guys say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to join the other side and fix the problem. Yeah. And, and I love that. And that's why we, Washington Engage, focuses on prevention. And we recruit, we could recruit anybody. You don't have to be a police, you don't have to be a service provider. Yeah. But everyone can do something about preventing human trafficking. Right. And I know that's an important part of your Washington Engage, and we'll be getting into that in a moment. Yeah. I want to get us into a little bit about what we've alluded to a bit, which is about how individuals are recruited and groomed. Is there anything else we could talk about? We, we got into this some. Yeah. Is there anything else we need to say about how individuals are recruited and groomed to get into that I system? Think so much of our culture grooms young people as well. Uh, which makes things challenging. Yeah. Um, our girls are conditioned to attract people by their appearance, looking sex sexy. If you read literature and books and if you have cho you know, young kids now, you know that uh, the objectification is such a big problem. In fact, American Psychological Association has published this report, national report called Sexualization of Girls, pointing out specific harms of how our culture mm -hmm. is objectifying them, causing problems of girls, boys, and adults. Mm -hmm. So they become objects instead of persons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And the, the advertising and other pressures are doing this at younger ages, so yeah. Because when you think about it, they're being, with they're being shown images of girls who look older, they may not be older, but they may look older, have more curves, have heavy makeup and all of this stuff, but developmentally, they're not there yet, so they mm -hmm. can't really look that way. So if there's a disparity between how they look and how they want to look, they can internalize that and say, oh my gosh, it's me, I'll never look that way, I'm a freak, I'm a problem. And then it goes down into depression. I won't have friends. I won't be popular. You just, schoolwork starts yeah. to fall apart. And it's, it's uh, um, seeing themselves as just in pieces, mm -hmm. this part of what self-objectification yeah. is. Mm -hmm. And so um, we try to, um, it, it's important for parents and educators to recognize something like that happening and, and try to support the girls and show them that's not true. You told me, uh, Linda, when we were preparing for the program, how 
owners and managers of strip clubs groom their waitresses mm -hmm. to again reduce the threshold between being a waitress or and starting to dabble into being a dancer or a stripper and tell us yeah because you, you if you're a waitress you're actually an employee with yeah. you know uh, a wage of some type and, um, and, and employer employee rights employee under rights state law you're Absolutely. an employee you have certain yeah. rights through the Department of Labor and Industries and, and so forth. And um, so the waitresses are considered employees, whereas the dancers are not. They are supposedly contractors. Um, and the waitresses are, well, first of all, managers try to create this illusion of everybody in the strip club being a family. We're kind of helping one another out, supporting one another, because they want to cut off support outside of the dancers and the waitresses, mm -hmm. just like you groom children for um, uh, sex that yeah. th is adult-oriented only. Um, you cut them off from caregivers who are adults, and you try to separate the child from their own I their own bar inner yeah. barriers. Yeah. So like, like religious cults do. You join the cult, and they break off contacts with yeah. the outside world, and, and your yeah. identity is based on that. Cult, yeah. and this would be sort of analogous they don't to even, that. You know, they want you to not turn to anybody outside of the club. Oh. And they will um, take girls out to dinner and say, you know, you're so great and you're great help to me. And, and what they do, like in between shifts of the dancers, they'll have the waitresses go up on the stage with a Windex bottle and a rag wearing short outfits but not no outfits and have music on and then they pretend to clean the mirrors that are the backdrop of the stage where the dancers actually perform. And so they get used to being up there and being the center of strange people's eyes, strange men's eyes. So if then the manager comes along some night and says, oh my gosh, one of my dancers didn't show up, won't you please do this for me just this one time? You're so beautiful and I'm sure you could do it, I won't ask you again. They may do it because A, this is family, B, they've been up there, and then if they do it once, it's less difficult to get them to do it mm -hmm. again. And then there's other ways they continue after that in terms of trying to tighten the hold. Everything from drug use to um, uh, uh, if they if they haven't um, if they need money um, or if they're a dancer and they haven't paid up their upfront fee, oh. then they're under the thumb of the management because they haven't made enough in, enough in tips and they have to do. Yeah whatever the management you, you tells work them. Work it off. They, yeah. they create the leverage in which to force the different yeah. girls, whether they're employees or supposed contractors, to do mm. what they want them to do yeah. and to get, go where the big money is for the strip club. Yeah. I can imagine that some people watching the program might think, well, if, 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 if the people get into that kind of a bind, why don't they speak out? Why don't they quit? Why don't they leave? And I wonder what you could say about how you'd, you'd answer those. I think that it is very difficult. Uh, it's harder to leave these situations than people really think. Oftentimes, so much of it is due to economic. Uh, so much of it is due to a sense of emotional entrapment and feeling like you don't have other options. A lot of it is due to fear. Uh, a lot of it is due to rejection from family and friends. You're so cut off after you've been engaged in these activities, you really don't mm -hmm. have anyone to turn to. Mm -hmm. is, is it somewhat like, like an, a, a victim of domestic violence who can't leave her abuser? Is, it, is, is there some of that I dynamic think some that's of the similar? dynamics are very similar. Uh -huh. yeah. There's a lot of shame involved, whether it's sex trafficking or people who have been in, in, in the sexual businesses. Uh -huh. um, they don't think they could do better. Uh, um, maybe I deserve what I'm... Mm -hmm. God. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's and, my fault. Yeah, and then sometimes they're used to that economic source. They really, you know, for them, even though they're being exploited by other people, but they're used to getting um, that kind of um, flattering and th their condition, even though they do not like it, they, they hate it, um, yet they, they just don't know where to turn. They don't see themselves mm -hmm. as being able to do better. 
and then they go, well, if I go out there and get a minimum wage, maybe I can still do better here, even though mm -hmm. they are definitely being exploited extremely. Well, they another, just don't understand. There's another reason for raising the minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> let, let people get out of abusive yeah. jobs. Yeah, they definitely and, need, they, they, we know. definitely could use intentional policy to support them. This is, and I know you got a lot of strengths in the mm -hmm. policy area. We want to get into <laughs> yeah. that. And, Couple and, minutes. and just like with, with domestic abuse, it doesn't start out that way. Uh -huh. I mean, nobody would get married. They wouldn't marry an abuser if right. the abuser started out being abusive. And so in the beginning, it, it sounds really good. Yeah. And yeah. they may feel like, oh my gosh, I've got so much power because I've got all these men looking at me. But as time goes on and they're asked to do things they're uncomfortable mm -hmm. with, and then they do them, and then they feel like, well, I've done it once, now, my gosh, I'm not so valuable anymore, yeah. and I may as well keep doing it's it to make the money I need. It's a lower self-esteem yeah. in exchange for the money, and you're kind of selling yeah. yourself. Yeah. The SEO. One of the things that we did with um, uh, Olympia City Council um, when uh, there was a strip club that opened in Olympia, and um, because dancers have to apply to the city for a license uh, after having some uh, good discussion with uh, the mayor and the city attorney. Um, they uh, said they would, they would accept our help in terms of a uh, little resource that we had come up with, the size of a bookmark, so it's small. So if somebody wanted to take it and use it, it wouldn't be a big, deal, it'd be something they could hide if they needed to, that has the number of the National Human Trafficking Resource Center so that they had and a texting number so that they could call if they finally decided they did want to leave, there was a place they could call to get help because that center has numbers from all over the country and could tell them where to go locally to get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same phone number, the same toll-free number yes, that, the, that you the quoted, truckers right, against trafficking right. use. And yes. I see in my, the research I did for the show, I could see that number pop up in a bunch of places. So yeah, yeah. that's that's good. Yeah. Um, let we talked some about the cultural factors, and I wonder, Dr. West, if you could say anything else about maybe the, maybe we've covered the relevant information, but if there's something else you could say about factors within our society that make people especially vulnerable to grooming and exploitation. Is there anything else that we haven't covered yet? I think that there's quite a bit because it is so pervasive. It's the movies that people are exposed to. Uh, it's advertising, it's toys. Uh, it's just about every aspect of our culture has become so sexualized mm -hmm. that it becomes normalized almost, this kind of sexual violence. So it's almost like we don't even see it anymore. It's, it's implicit in a lot of, I mean, a, a disgusting amount. I don't, I don't have any TV reception any longer. Mm -hmm. Don't tell TCTV <laughs> uh, I can't watch their program. But I don't have any TV, I, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's mostly garbage. <laughs> so, uh, ex except for this and very few other things. Um, uh, but it, it's, it, it's around us in so many places, you know. Yeah. Um, well, the grooming, you know, mm. in another aspect, we need to recognize that Every, most teenagers have a smartphone where access to pornography is just like ordering pizza. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, the average age of being exposed to pornography is younger, age 11. Younger. And um, it's mm. not uncommon for adults to notice that teenagers are looking at something really laughing and they won't let you see it. Oh. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, porn is porn is teen porn. Child porn is the most searched word on Google. And huh. you know, just think um, we don't have to. You know, our culture grooms them, and also the access is so easy. It's accessible. Mm -hmm. It's anonymous. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one. It's affordable. It's affordable. <laughs> it's easily available. There's, there's it, they start stuff. out right. offering it yeah. cheap, and yeah. then when the addiction gets yeah. hard, then that's when they get you yeah. to buy. Um, and that's why that grooming, it's our culture. And then it's so available that they get deeper and deeper into it. Yeah. I, I see this similar to the way militarism has crept so much into our culture where 
uh, we used to have a war and then a long stretch of peacetime, then mm -hmm. a war and long stretch of peace. And now we have multiple wars going on all the time. That's the baseline. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the context for everything. And so we have a very much a militarized culture where if you have a problem with somebody, we should go bomb them, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that's, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's the baseline response. And a lot of the research that's being funded through colleges and universities is funded through the Pentagon. There's not as much pure research funding, but it's, it's done through the Pentagon or the CIA or whatever who looking for some kind of a weapons application for it and stuff. There's just, uh, and, and the, the basic premise of militarism is if you want to get your way, use violence against other people. And that becomes the norm. And we see that. You know, at more pervasive in our society. Yeah. So it's one of these things that is per so pervasive in the society is it's like the fish don't have a concept of water because mm -hmm. they're in it all the time. Right. And, and, and we, ha we have very few opportunities and spaces to talk about healthy sexuality. Yeah. And that is really damaging. And so young people don't even have a concept, uh, and we haven't done a good job as adults yeah. of, of providing that for them. Yeah. So the culture then grooms them in right. ways that are not Yeah, be Music that's, that's extremely mm -hmm. sexist, and liquor ads and beer ads mm -hmm. and stuff are all, almost all that is sexist. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been, companies and corporations tell us that sex sells and we sell what you want, but really, they're forcing it on us, yeah. and most of us sit in, sitting out uh, in front of TV mm -hmm. are just not one. You know, the yeah. images are beyond what we what's acceptable, mm -hmm. and yet they p keep pushing yeah. the envelope. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk some about solution. I think the viewers by now have a pretty good mm -hmm. sense of where you're coming from as to the the kinds of problems that exist and some of the sources of it, and. Uh, I really appreciate the, the work that all three of you are doing to, to turn things around and you know, lift up and expose it, um, and then, and then to, to do some good shifting. Um, Rose, you founded this organization, Washington Engage, that has a wonderful website. I know you're doing good work. And Linda, whom I've known for decades, is connected with the Thurston County Coalition Against Trafficking, which is part of your statewide uh, organization. And I, I, I read this, the, the, the resources that you folks provided, mm -hmm. and, and you've got this good approach that goes beyond the usual law enforcement approach. Oh, let's just go arrest the prostitutes and that's it. You go, wait a minute, there are way better approaches than that. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about some of these. Tell us about the strategies for reducing demand for sexual exploitation that Washington Engage is doing. Um. It's, the research is not, was not done by us. Many scholars and national organizations mm -hmm. have done the research knowing that um, sex trafficking is a business, mm -hmm. supply and demand. Um, the more demand, the more there's demand for young girls or women for, for commercial sex, then the more mm -hmm. traffickers would want to make it join the business. Mm -hmm. That's why, drug traffickers are moving to sex trafficking because it's more profitable. Mm -hmm. So if we can target the demand, usually men who are buying sex, if we can target the arrest of Johns who are out there buying sex and tell them that law enforcement, your police chief will come after you, will arrest you if you attempt to buy sex mm -hmm. from, from whoever. That is a way to target the demand. So that's, yes, that's a criminal justice approach, and I highly recommend our mm -hmm. law enforcement to focus on that because it's easier to arrest sex buyers who are a lot of times white collar, blue collar, blue collar folks who have a job. They don't mm -hmm. want to be arrested, but they take the risk because they don't think they will ever be arrested. Right, mm -hmm. and, and that's, a, a, that's, your research has shown that it, that's more effective than trying to arrest a prostitute who, may not have other options, mm -hmm. but but a, a guy who's buying it or looking to buy it mm -hmm. uh, doesn't have to do that. I mean, he has more freedom to abstain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's based on gender equality. Mostly, mm -hmm. most people who are, in, who are being trafficked are women, mm -hmm. and 
we, if we want to have gender equality, which really the, the policies started in Sweden where they approach it in the same way and have had great success yeah. in improving gender equality. Right, um, and that's their framework for it because you, you talked about that on the phone when we were preparing for the show that they, in Sweden, they see, they, they have a, a pretty good sense for a number of years about equal rights. In fact, their national legislature is half women mm -hmm. and, and they have a better sense of gender equality. And so then when they look at sex commercial exploitation, yeah. they're coming at it from that frame and then it's like, why should women be punished for selling it and not men for buying it? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. so what you they, could tell they, us some about what, what they, they did was it. they decriminalized the side of women. So they don't arrest uh, the, the women or the girls, um, but they do arrest the Johns. Mm -hmm. Now, and, uh, and they have found that doing that, prosecuting the Johns, has had a very salutary effect on the um, population as a whole in really bringing down sales numbers yeah. uh, of men buying. And compared to, say, Denmark, decriminalized both sides. And what happened, unfortunately, was that organized crime came in and took over and created a situation where, OK, they could then control the women and the buyers and create a situation that was unhealthy for mm -hmm. both and unsafe for both and profitable for them. Yeah. So that's, although it sounds, you know, like a perfect dream, yeah. you know, de decriminalize it for everybody, it did not end up being the safest and best labor situation for both. Yeah. Whereas Sweden's has turned out very helpful and, and healthy. And my understanding is that Sweden not only took it as a public health issue, mm -hmm. uh, not only as a gender equality issue, but also as a public health, using yes. a public health model to approach it, instead of a tough on crime model. And they also, from my understanding, um, they provide funding and services so that women who want to get out of the business mm -hmm. can get out of the business and prepare Have for other something options. else. Other options, yeah. yeah. It's more of an empowerment thing mm -hmm. for people who've been disempowered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is definitely one thing that's needed because as there's been more policy, which I hope Rose gets a chance to talk about, uh, there's been more policy enacted around our country, but unfortunately, not a lot of that policy has included funding for yeah. the survivors. Right. Yeah. In fact, I, I know some some states have passed what sound like really good laws, but not provided any funding. Mm -hmm. yes, so the politicians can say, "Wow, look at this great law mm -hmm. that we passed," mm -hmm. and then they they can still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and in yeah. fact, our state so two years ago we were part of the legislative work that we. Our state has passed similar laws like Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, when police arrest the buyers, um, they are being, the buyers have to pay a high fine, um, 5,000 if they happen to buy a girl, a minor, 1,500 if they happen to buy a, a 18 year old older. So that money that the jurisdiction, the fine and the impoundment of the vehicle will actually stay within the jurisdiction half of it goes to um, victim services and half of that stays with the jurisdiction to continue the police in, uh, arrest of buyers. Mm -hmm. um, we have that in law on the book already for almost three years. They need to be enforced and yet they're rarely enforced um, except in King County and a few other counties are starting to respond. I highly recommend our law enforcement to look at the law we have and enforce it because that's how you can support like the family family support center here mm -hmm. in Niles County um, and then you can continue the police investigation um, and then you can also end demand and tell tell the buyers your chief is after you um, mm -hmm. don't go buy <laughs> women yeah. or, or yeah. girls yeah. and that's how we can end end the demand but of course we want to talk about the cultural grooming aspect because that continues to groom yeah. the demand from the time when they're very young. Yeah, the, the point that you made about going after law enforcement in mm -hmm. the other 38 counties besides King County, mm -hmm. that would be a great opportunity for people who want to get involved to help somehow, no matter where you live, contact your local law enforcement agency mm -hmm. and, and, have, and connect with you folks to yeah, find out 
what to do, connect yeah. with you folks. I'm familiar and with connect. the law, and I'm familiar with all that, and I can help you yeah. go to yeah. OMAC, Washington, and get yeah. the for law enforced. Yeah, <laughs> and so that's something that, that volunteers could do any Anywhere. place in the state mm -hmm. or beyond if you have good laws in other states that are not being used. Um, we, we all know that when tobacco companies did a lot of advertising for decades and decades, and this was the, the cool thing, this is the sexy thing, this is the, the with it, the whatever, whatever, whatever. And in recent decades, smoking, instead of being really cool and sexy, became gross and disgusting. And now it, it's kind of a low class thing. And it would be interesting to, to do a cultural shift so that the kinds of uh, sexualizing of people, uh, inappropriate kind of stuff, uh, is, is through advertising or movies or music or whatever gets looked upon as being, wow, how, that's low class. You know? yeah, and I think we have to change our language uh, and not see particular minors as prostitutes uh, when they're really victims mm -hmm. and buyers as not buyers or they're, purchasers of sex, but a, yeah, or as child sexual abusers. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to really change our language. Yeah, now. that that kind of stuff would help, and that's mm -hmm. cultural shifting stuff. You folks have a cultural grooming forum coming up uh, uh, on March 12 in Lacey, right near Olympia. Uh, who can tell us about your forum on cultural grooming? I'll start and of okay. course we, um, Dr. West is going to be our keynote speaker. Uh -huh. um, we met in Boston at a conference where we were looking at the correlation between pornography and sex trafficking and we, st and we got to learn a lot. And along with what we've been talking about, our culture grooms us, um, grooms victims grooms victimization, grooms the exploiters. Mm. And um, therefore, we want to start... Is, this is your entitlement as a male, mm. right? This is what <laughs> men are entitled to. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we belong on top, and, mm -hmm. and we, we can control and use and, as we and, see fit. And a lot of it's the commercialization of the sexuality. Mm. And, and that's why um, even, I have to say, say, even men are victims because they are being groomed to, to do what all these, all the culture tells them, this mm -hmm. is what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. and, and women are groomed to be victim in, in mm -hmm. on the other side. So what's coming up is we want to begin a conversation of the cultural grooming, mm -hmm. how it harms us. Most people have been trying to avoid talking about it because it's about sex. They think it's First Amendment and and they, they cannot talk about it, otherwise they're being considered brood or, you know, just, mm -hmm. you know, old-fashioned. Yeah. We want to pro provide a forum to begin the conversation. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about maybe the drama I, that we're going to have and, and then you're followed by keynote. Mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're, we're talking about uh, trafficking, and we're talking primarily about trafficking of minors, so that's children, that's under 18. And number one, that's, that's different uh, than, um, than adults. It doesn't mean that adults actually have choice, but children have even less yeah. choice. Um, so we're looking at how does all of the images, and we see hundreds of images every day. They see hundreds of images because there's no barrier between adult and children stuff on, on an iPod. Um, and they're being shown things that they don't have judgment for, um, and they think that they're supposed to look and act a certain way, um, whether it's boys, the hypermasculinity that actually has links to violence, and you know the girl's hypersexuality, which is in your value is in how you look and whether you can please a male in a sexual way. There's lots of ways that we are pleased by sexuality. This isn't to say there's only one way for sexuality to be pleasing. For adults 
who uh, understand that and who have respect for one another and who have, you know, who have intimate relationships, who want to be there and, they're, and it's not being done for money, that's a whole different show mm. than what we're talking about. Yeah. We're not saying that's got to go. We're saying that when you bring money into the equation and when you're talking about uh, people who haven't that ability yet because they're not developmentally ready or they've been psychologically prepared since elementary school to think and see themselves a certain way, then there's a lot of garbage to get through before you can get to a good place of looking at what do you really enjoy for sexuality? Yeah. And so getting through that garbage is what our forum basically yeah. is going to be about. Yeah. And we're, we're tight on time, so we want to be fairly brief and then... Uh, my we, goal is to talk about how our culture has contributed uh, to creating an environment where sexual trafficking tends to flourish. Yeah. So media influences, music, advertising, and those types of things. Yeah. Good. So we're this, the information. This will be on Thursday, March 12, uh, at a location on Carpenter Road in Lacey, and you will have information at the Washington and Gage website mm -hmm. uh, by the beginning of February. So people will have a chance to get there and and uh, register and, and so forth. Um, there there are a lot of things, a lot of other solutions, and and. Can you tell us just really briefly about some policy options? Because uh, uh, we, we have just really only a couple minutes left. And I want to make sure we, we have the notion that there are agencies that could do things that they're not doing. And then we'll have to wrap things up. Um, policy options. We talk about commercial sexual exploitation in businesses that, we, that government licenses, like illicit massage. Um, strip clubs, and even bikini barista stand out of state leads the nation on that phenomenon, uh -huh. which is really another outfit for commercial sexual exploitation. Um, the licensing of um, illicit massage could be changed, and um, the independent contractor relationship that is an illusion, uh, the, the independent contractor relationship of the dancers to the owner Government can do something about it because it violates the IRS rule. Um, many of these bikini barista stands um, fail the health inspection test. Nobody is doing anything about it. And again, these girls are also considered independent contractor. They're not being paid as a barista. Yeah. So we can use common sense approach mm -hmm. on this problem. And on our website, I have a whole um, policy recommendation booklet that people can it's, access. It's very good. I read it. It's really, really good. It's like creative ideas. So this is all at Washington uh, Engage, which is www.waengage, waengage.com. Um, there are a number of other organizations that are doing good stuff. Mm -hmm. Polaris uh, Project and others. We have the Thurston County Coalition Against Trafficking. And we'll have credits listed at the end of the program, which will occur in just a moment uh, and then also if people want to look at these uh, visually uh, we'll have them on the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation's website they can visit olympiafor.org click TV programs and click the description of our February 2015 program and read the description of it mm -hmm. and and it'll have all the websites and, and the names of organizations there's just a lot available so I want to thank uh, all three of our guests for mm -hmm. participating, for informing us so much. Um, uh, Rose Gunderson, Dr. Carolyn West, Linda Malinshuk finnan I'm impressed with the work that, that your organization and other organizations are doing. The research is out there. Grassroots people are working on it. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of potential. We need to lift this up for visibility and, and, and volunteer and, and get working on it. Uh, people can get information about a lot of other uh, issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolence by contacting the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at uh, 491 9093, that's in area code 360, or www.olympiafor.org. 
the Thurston County Coalition uh, Against Trafficking is at 360-357-7272. So that's a good way to connect. You meet monthly out at Olympia High School on the second Thursday evening of each month. Well, not at the high school, but near I mean, the high near school. near the high school. The it's Good at, Shepherd it's Lutheran, Lutheran Church. Lutheran Church or the Good Shepherd is near Olympia High School. I'm sorry, yeah. It's uh, south of North Street, which yeah. sounds funny, but yeah. it really is the address, 1601 <laughs> North Street, <laughs> Southeast. You yeah. have to live in Olympia to understand. Yeah, six, six o'clock, uh, second Thursday of every month. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thanks. Well, th I want to thank all of our guests. Thank the folks who've been watching. Thank you, Glenn. And get out thank there you, and let's, let's turn this thing around. Thank you.